Welcome to lecture one on oscillations and simple harmonic motion. And this lecture is going to be about springs and Hooke's law. So what I want us to imagine is a um, spring. It can be stretched, maybe it can also be squished, hanging from a ceiling. And when it's just hanging there um, by itself, like I've drawn it here, it has a certain length. Right? I might call this the original length of the spring here as I've written it out in very small letters. Now let this bottom of the spring be our reference line. Right? Now I imagine I'm going to hang masses from that spring. You can imagine as I'm doing that, that will stretch the spring. So for example, here I have hung 20 grams from it, and I can measure how far this pulls down the, um, the end of the spring. So I'm measuring this from the bottom of the spring, right? So from here to here, that's the distance by which the spring has stretched. And I could imagine that if I were like in a real lab, in a real classroom, that I do this experiment with different masses, and every time I make sure the spring hangs, you know, perfectly still, I don't, I don't let it wobble, I try to bring it to rest, where does it come to rest? Um, and so I can take a bunch of measurements like that. What I'll find is that the weight that I hang from it, the mass that's hanging from it, therefore the weight of um, this, is proportional to the stretch length. In other words, if I hang twice the mass from it, from 20 grams to 40 grams, so twice the weight is acting on it, then the spring is going to stretch twice as far, so the 60 grams is going to stretch three times as far. Of course, those values, those I just made up for this example, a different spring would have different values. So, let me plot this on a graph. You can imagine having a graph. I'm plotting the um, stretch against the tension in the, in the spring. Um, I should have plotted this the other way around. So I want to have the tension up here. Tension. And here's the, the stretch of the spring. So we call this X, the tension T. Now, of course, when they're at rest, right, the tension is always going to be equal to the weight. So um, tension, if it right here, that is equal to mg if hanging still. Because the forces have to cancel out. Now let me plot this on a graph. When I have no mass hanging, then there's no stretch. It's fairly, fairly obvious. So zero, zero is a point. Um, then if I have a stretch that's one centimeter, this be 0 0.01 meters, I get a force. Um, in this case, 20 grams would be 0 0.2 newtons. If I say g is 10, not 9.8, we're going to go with 10. Um, I would get 0 0.2 newtons. If the spring stretches by 2 centimeters, then I get... Um, 0.4 newtons, right, the weight of 40 grams. And if I go keep going, 0.03 meters of stretch right from here to here, um, then I'm going to get a tension of 0.6 newtons. And then you can easily see that those indeed form a, form a straight line, right? So I haven't drawn it perfectly, but this should be, should be a straight line. Now, I didn't draw it perfectly, that's okay. In a real-life experiment, we'd have some measurement error anyway. So what we get, if we do this experiment, is we get the relationship that the force of the tension, force in the spring, is equal to some constant, let's call this constant k, I guess for constant, um, times x, times the stretch. This constant is, has a name, it's called the, um, the spring constant. Right, so this k here, this constant of proportionality is the spring constant. What is its interpretation? Um, 
Well, it essentially tells me if I have one meter of stretch, what's the force I'm going to get, right? So what's the, how many newtons do I get per meter? So newtons per meter and force per stretch. Of course, a spring might actually stretch to be a meter long, right? If I give you a small spring that you can hold in your hand, it's likely not a meter long. And it will bend out of shape and no longer act like a spring if you did that in real life. But I can still say, you know, per meter, how many newtons do I get, even if the spring itself only ever stretches to a couple of centimeters. I'm going to modify this expression a little bit, because what I notice is that if I, if the displacement x is down, then the force is up, right? Let me actually draw the, the force here. There's the tension up, or the spring force, we call this F spring, and um, the weight, the weight of course is down. So what I notice is that the spring force opposes the direction of x. So if x is my positive direction, like I have my um, coordinate system and it points downwards, then the force is actually negative. It's the opposite direction of the spring. So I'm gonna, gonna stick a minus sign here, right? Because it's the opposite direction of the displacement. The force opposes displacement. And by displacement, I mean displacement um, of the end of the spring. Right? That was how I was tracking. This point here gets displaced down to here, where the force is up. If I imagine I would squish this spring, so I haven't drawn this here, but if you imagine I manually take my hand there and I push it, I squeeze it, well, then the force of the spring would be downwards, but it's pushing back. Right? The spring is trying to push back towards this one, one point, so-called equilibrium point. I'm going to talk about more in just a second. So let's just quickly do an example, have an example calculation using that, that concept. This is the example. I imagine I have a spring and it has a, a spring constant k that is 5.0 newtons per meter. So if I stretch this spring by one meter, or not that's actually possible, it's a different question. But if I were to stretch it by one meter, it will pull back um, with a force of 5 newtons. If I were to stretch it by one centimeter, one hundredth of a meter, Will it, pull, pull, it would pull back with one hundredth of five newtons, so 0 0.05 newtons. Now I, I have a 200 gram mass that's hanging from the spring. And the first thing I want to find is, well, if it's just hanging there, what's the distance by which the, the spring stretches? And the second part is I want to figure out what happens if I pull the mass down further by, say, an extra 10 centimeters, um, what will be the acceleration of the mass as a result? Let's do this one first. So I imagine I have my spring. And when there's nothing attached, it looks like this. And now it's pulled down further. I've got a 200 gram mass here. Um, I want to find what is this stretch distance um, x. So what do I know? I know that the, the forces on this is the tension, the spring force, spring tension. Um, just now I called it the spring force, so I'm going to stick with it. And then there's, of course, the weight. And those are the only two forces acting. The weight is mg. So because it's hanging there, those two are equal, right? So I have that uh, the spring force is equal to kx. So we just discovered what happened to the minus sign. Um, well, yes, it's the opposite direction, but in this, I'm right now just caring about defining the magnitude of it. And so I have kx is equal to mg because the, the mass is hanging there there can't be any net force. If there was a net force, it wouldn't be staying there, right? So I have kx is equal to mg 
So I can find x mg over k. Um, we plug in the values 0 0.2 kilograms, right? That's what we get my units right, 200 grams, but if we're going to convert to kilograms, we need to put this up so you can see it better, times 10 meters per second squared, yes, 9.8. We're going to go with 10 divided by k. k is a measure of how tough is my spring. Um, our case, the value was 5. Newtons per meter. So what does this make? I put 0 0.2 times 10. That makes 2. So I divide 2 by 5. That is 0 0.4 meters, 40 centimeters. It was part A. Now let's consider part B. Um, so we start a new page here. So part B had us um, pull the mass down further. Let me just show you again what it says. It says, if I pull down the mass an extra 10 centimeters, what will be the acceleration of that mass? So let's figure this one out. So I imagine I've got my spring. And the mass, the spring is stretched. It's stretched a bit further now. The mass is still 200 grams. But I am told, right, I've stretched it an extra 10 centimeters. So the total stretch, so this is the natural length of it, the total stretch is not 40 centimeters, but about 50 centimeters. This is my, the length it would hang, I pull it down an extra 10, so that's 0 0.5 meters. So I can look at the forces and you can tell right away, right, the weight hasn't changed. That is still mg as before, um, which was 2 newtons. 0.2 times 10. Now the tension has become bigger because I've pulled it down further. Right? And the force um, of the spring, the spring tension is equal to k times x, which in our case is 5 newtons per meter, times 0 0.5 meters, so that is 2.5 newtons. So does that imply, imply, it implies that the net force on the mass is 2.5 up, 2 down, so it's 0.5 up, so f net is equal to 2.5 newtons minus 2 newtons, that's 0 0.5 newtons up. Um, so we can find the acceleration of the mass. A is net force divided by um, divided by the mass. So M, 0 0.5 newtons divided by 0 0.2 kilograms, um, and that comes to 2.5 meters per second squared. Of course, the instant it starts moving, it's changing the stretch, right? It's going to start moving upwards, that will shorten the spring, and so the acceleration is only that value right at this instant. A fraction of a second later, when the mass has moved up a bit, the spring is less stretched. Now, what is it going to do overall? How will it continue? Will it come to that? Uh, that is the motion that we get as a result is going to be what's called a simple harmonic motion. But um, we'll come back to that. So now let's look at a spring that's horizontally. I imagine there's some kind of um, fixed point here at which I'm going to touch my spring that can't move. On the other end, I've got a mass, and the mass can slide back and forth. I imagine the surface to be frictionless, probably not really realistic with most surfaces, um, but you know, we can worry about friction later. So if the mass is at a point where the spring has its natural length, it's not squished, it's not stretched, um, then we call that point the, the equilibrium point, at least in this situation here. It's called the equilibrium point because right now there is no force, no net force on that, um, on that mass. Right now the only forces on it would be the weight down and the normal force up 
but we're not going to worry about those. We're just going to worry about the left-right forces. And I'm going to imagine that I can, I can do two things. I can either stretch the spring, so I'm going, to, I'm going to take that mass in my hand and I'm going to move it to the right. Now I decided that I'm going, going to call it the direction to the right. I'm going to call that the x direction, positive x direction that way. Could have called it anything else, could have had it point the other way. That's the choice I'm going with. So I'm pulling the mass out to a certain x value, right? Maybe from here to here, 2 centimeters. x equals 2 centimeters. So I put a positive displacement because the mass is put to the right. Now you can tell right away that the spring is going to pull back with a force to the left. So the spring force is to the left. So the force is negative. It's a negative direction because x points to the right negative um, force, i.e. to the left, the way I've drawn it. Had I chosen my x direction to point the other way, right, that's a choice I have, then the displacement here would have been negative and the force would have been positive. This goes back to the minus sign in the equation f equals minus kx that I showed you before. Um, and one major omission that I that I made when I showed this to you, let me just go back a second here, so I should have of course said that this, this equation here, is what we call Hooke's law. It's really the statement of the linearity between the force and x and that it points in the opposite direction of the displacement. And it has consequences. So now we're here, right, and the spring is compressed, so I physically put my finger there and moved the mass to the left, maybe then I let go. So what's going to happen is, well, there's going to be a force to the right. We know that the strength of the force depends on how much I squish it or stretch it, and what type of spring do I have, right? The value k, that spring constant, depends on the type of spring, what is it made of, how thick it is, is it, how big are the windings. Essentially, I hand you a spring and it has a given value for the spring constant. Um, okay, so what you notice is that the force always points back towards this, this middle point, the so-called equilibrium point, right? So F, always points, I guess I should really make this a vector, so always points towards the equilibrium point, um, and when that happens, we call F a restoring force because it's essentially trying to restore the the state um, that we had up here, that state where the mass is right at that point. If I'm too far left, the force pushes me right. If I'm too far right, the force pushes me left. It always tries to get me back to that, that point. Um, so we call F is a, we call it a restoring force. It's trying to restore equilibrium. In fact, the equilibrium point is of course called that not just because um, the force here is zero. I mean, that technically does make an equilibrium point, but specifically it is a stable equilibrium. What that means is that if the mass moves a little bit to the left, if I don't quite get it right, that's okay. The force is going to push it back towards the exact equilibrium point. If I miss the equilibrium point by a little bit, uh, the mass is a bit too far right, that's okay. The force is going to pull it back towards the equilibrium. And we'll think about that a little bit more in terms of energy in a follow-up lecture. That is called a restoring force. And um, we also notice that F is proportional to the, the displacement from equilibrium. 
and that means it is linear right we saw the straight line graph between the force and the displacement um, so f is linear and so overall we say the force due to a spring is a linear restoring force so this is a term you will likely come across in future lectures in your reading um, or in in the lab finally i want to go back to the hanging spring so we looked at the spring now it was horizontal we figured out the equilibrium point was really just the, the point where the spring has its natural length if we go back to the hanging spring, right, this might be the natural length of the spring. And there's nothing hanging from it. And at that point, the spring force is zero. The spring is not stretched. It's not compressed. So it does not apply any force. If I hang a mass from the spring, while it is at that length, so that's the middle picture here, well, now there's a force on it, right, because there's, the, there's a mass. And the mass has a weight. So at this point, there's still no spring force because the spring, I mean, the spring only acts when it's stretched or, or compressed. Um, so there's a weight that is not cancelled out by anything. So the net force is not zero. And that point is not an equilibrium point. But if I then let the spring um, stretch a certain amount and I let it uh, stretch just enough so that the spring force that is equal to uh, kx, um, of course, that is equal to the weight, then again the net force is zero, right, because those two cancel out, um, and that is my new equilibrium point. And of course, I can calculate the distance. That's essentially what we did in the example um, we did a few minutes ago. That the this equilibrium stretch of the spring. By what distance is the spring stretched to bring the mass to its new equilibrium point? It's going to be kx equals mg. So this equilibrium stretch is mg divided by k. So the effect of turning your spring vertical is we're going to get a constant force in the direction of the spring and all that does is that it shifts the equilibrium point so um, turning our spring mass system be vertical it introduces a constant force so right mg does not change unless I change the mass or I change the planet I'm on um, but the weight is constant it does not depend on how high up is this mass it's a constant force um, in the direction of the spring force in the vertical here what does this do this shifts the equilibrium point shifts the it's going to be an m shifts the equilibrium point now let me make this point uh, more explicit so let's imagine now this is my spring and it is it is at equilibrium right so at the equilibrium point so let's imagine this is the zero stretch length right here um, so this distance here right is x equilibrium now i defined my my x direction to be this my x coordinate system starts here um, this is some x value that i call the x equilibrium what happens if i 
redefine the motion of this, so redescribe it, but starting at its equilibrium point. So let me define a new coordinate system, let's call it y, that points the same direction, positive x is positive y, um, except the origin is not where the, the spring isn't stretched, but the origin is where the, um, the mass is hanging at the equilibrium point. So, what happens then? So, I drew you this little picture here. Um, I imagine that I have my equilibrium point, and I'm now going to pull this, this the mass down further. So, I'm displacing it from this um, its equilibrium point by a distance that I'm now calling y. And that means, of course, it's, it's displaced from the zero stretch length of the spring by a greater distance, namely... Um, y plus the equilibrium stretch. So I can write down y. The value of y here is the value of x, the x coordinate of this point, minus this. For example, if this is 2 centimeters, then the value of y at this point might be 1 centimeter. The value of x would be 3 centimeters. Let's look at the forces down here. So there's clearly a tension up, and there's going to be a weight down. Mg, as always, and um, this is the spring force. Let's figure out what is the net force in this situation. So, F net is going to be, so I, I've defined my downwards to be positive, so it's going to be Mg minus the spring force. Right, just because I've set all my coordinate systems point down. Uh, it was a choice I could have chosen differently. Now, that's of course equal to mg. Then minus, what's the spring force? It's k. Is it k times x or k times y? Well, the spring got stretched from up here, right? So the tension is k times x. x equals zero means no spring force. Now, I can, I can rewrite that as mg minus k times what? k times an x. x is y plus x equivalent. So x, sorry, equilibrium. Right, equilibrium. This being the constant that is the distance between the zero stretch of the spring and the, the equilibrium point. But I have a value for this, right? I know that the equilibrium point is given by mg over k. That's what we calculated. It must be true because that is where the forces are equal. So this is equal to mg minus ky plus, oops, excuse me, minus, right? The minus goes inside, minus, um, minus k times x equilibrium, x equilibrium is mg over k, plugging this in, now we can see right away, mg minus k times mg over k cancels out, the net force is just minus ky. Now that's interesting, um, because what it's telling us is that if I take the new equilibrium point, as my zero point, then this looks exactly like the horizontal spring. I essentially can throw out the fact that there's gravity. All that gravity did was change where the equilibrium point was, but I'm back to having a linear restoring force here created by the spring force and the weight together. So spring force and weight together create a linear restoring, a form a linear restoring force. Linear restoring, I'm going to squeeze this in, um, force, yeah, you can hardly read it, linear restoring force. 
So that justifies the statement I made up here, right? It shifts the equilibrium point, but it doesn't really change anything else because in this case, the constant K, that's the same constant of the spring. So the net force acts, the net force of the combination of the spring force, the actual spring force and the weight together, um, they act as if the weight wasn't there, provided you change your coordinates, your origin, down to the new equilibrium point. And so we therefore expect that any other sort of behavior, like when we watch later on, watch the masses oscillate, that it doesn't matter, matter whether or not the spring is hanging or horizontal. Um, the only thing that changes is where is the equilibrium point. Okay, that's it for the introduction to, um, to springs and Hooke's law. For the, the rest of this segment of the course, we're mostly going to look at how do they, how do the masses say on springs move? What are the consequences of all of this? Um, one thing to say though right now about this is that when we're studying springs or masses on springs, we're not literally studying just masses on springs. We're studying all sorts of other systems whose behavior is well approximated by the same mathematics, specifically by linear restoring forces. And for a lot of systems, um, systems where there are small oscillations, those oscillations can be well approximated by exactly this sort of linear restoring force that is modeled by a mass on a spring. So, um, for example, some, some atomic bonds, right, forming molecules, they might vibrate, that can be modeled as if there was a spring connecting them. Uh, rubber bands and bungee cords they they stretch they're not literally springs they can't be squished but as they stretch they essentially create a linear um, restoring force and we're going to see lots of other examples um, pendulums say or flexible materials um, which you know that they're a, a thin say um, rod of some kind it's straight you can sort of push it down a bit it'll wobble a bit um, that, that wobble, that oscillation can be approximated by exactly the same, um, same physics, the same mathematics of a mass and a spring. And in fundamental um, aspects of physics, say in field theory, for example, if you really go deep into, um, into say particle physics, um, you'll find that just this, the mathematics of a mass and a spring is a model for an incredible amount of physics. Um, it, it's kind of amazing. And there are mathematical reasons for it, and we'll come to those. All right, thanks for listening.